Yes, we can. A phrase that was powerful enough to get a black man in the White House for the first time in American history. Yes, we can. Thank you. God bless you. But it's also a phrase that fills you with the audacity to hope and dream. And one such ridiculous dream was the 1987 Cricket World Cup. Before we tell you about 1987, let's time travel straight back four years earlier to 1983, when India had miraculously done the unthinkable at the mecca of cricket. In our previous Cricket.com classic video on the Asia Cup history, we told you about the story of NKP Salve and how he was humiliated by English cricket officials when he was denied extra passes for the World Cup final at Lord's. That dishonour slapped him awake to the reality of power dynamics in cricket. India may have won the biggest prize of the game, but it was England who held the sceptre. Siddharth Shankar Ray, a politician of the Indian National Congress, just like Salve, also failed to get passes for the World Cup final. He further instigated an already ingrained Salve to set the ball rolling for a change in the status quo. The English monopoly in cricket had to be broken. But how? How was he going to do that? The answer came in the form of the 1987 Cricket World Cup. As you all know, until 1983, all Cricket World Cups were held in England. Salve knew that for the shift in power axis, the World Cup needed to move out of England. But the biggest challenge in organising the World Cup was money. For the 1983 World Cup, England had to give £20,000 to every country participating in the World Cup. But where would that money come from? Well, the BCCI and the PCB in those days hardly had enough money to even pay their own players. Their cricket infrastructure was outdated and insufficient. There was no way they would be able to dish out crores and crores of rupees for the World Cup. This is the point where the men who ran cricket needed help to the men who played politics. Yes, it was NKP Salve who had the support of Miss Indira Gandhi for the World Cup goal, who was a leader of the political party and also the Prime Minister of India in 1983. However, the Iron Lady was assassinated by her own bodyguards in the following year and her son, Rajiv Gandhi, a pilot then, was reluctantly forced into politics and made the Prime Minister. Anyway, Salve knew that he would need the Indian government to be on his side to successfully get the World Cup to India. After Indira passed, Salve used his political connections to get close to Rajiv Gandhi. But back then, India was still a third world country with a closed economy and had very limited foreign reserves. There was no way that the government could spend tens of crores on cricket when it almost had a billion people to feed. This is the point in the story where Dhirubhai Ambani enters the field. Founder and head of the Reliance Industries, he had the resources the BCCI and the PCB needed for the tournament. But why would he pay just for charity? He was a businessman after all, and the Reliance company as such was then a minuscule deal in size compared to what it is now, as you can see. And the reasons were simple for Dhirubhai and Bani to take up this project. Branding, advertisement, recognition. In cricket's rising popularity, Dhirubhai saw a cash cow that he could be milking for years to establish as Reliance is a leading corporate company in India. Salve got in touch with Rajiv Gandhi, who after one round of failed negotiations, managed to get Ambani on board to sponsor the tournament. Earlier, the finance minister of his cabinet, VP Singh, had ordered some income tax raids in Ambani, sourcing Reliance in relations with the Indian government. However, a few years later, when Singh was transferred to the defence ministry, the government reached out to Ambani again, and this time he was ready to finance the tournament. But Dhirubhai just wanted one personal thing from Rajiv Gandhi in all of this. What was that? Well, he wanted to sit beside Indian Prime Minister during the India-Pakistan exhibition game before the tournament. Mr. Gandhi readily agreed to the request and Ambani shelled out the bucks needed to win the rights for the World Cup. Remember, the ICC also needed the host to improve their broadcasting infrastructure. So Dur Darshan, who in the lieu of ad revenues agreed to come on board as the official broadcaster of the tournament. This broadcasting infrastructure that was being built by Doordarshan for the World Cup was also used later 
to air Ravanan Sagar's Ramayan, which brought the entire nation in front of a television. And guess when did Ramayan start airing? The answer, my friend, is 1987, as in later in the same year, all the matches of the World Cup were aired live for the first time in Indian television history. And television was a new craze in India after all, and cricket was one of the major reasons behind it. So finally, coming back to our stories, when with all conditions met and rights won, the World Cup was coming out of England. India and Pakistan would confirm the hosts, and Ambani made sure Reliance was the front and centre of it. What was a Prudential Cup until 1983 was now officially called the Reliance Cup in 1987. Dhirubhai even made his younger son, Anil Ambani, of the organising committee of the World Cup, and Anil knew what his father's aim in his expensive endeavour was. The Reliance and the Ambanis were at the front and centre of this entire event, and it wasn't a World Cup for them, it was the Reliance Cup. However, it was the BCCI who got what they wished for, and at the end of the day, that was all which mattered. Salve's humiliation, can you believe it, triggered a chain of events that transformed the cricketing world. And India had finally said to the cricketing world, Yes, we can.